It's back and bigger than ever. It's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Soonerscoop crew. Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. All right, we are back. It is time for another edition of the unofficial 40 podcast where the entire crew is here. We got... Lots to talk about as the Sooners are back on the football field this weekend as uh, the whole gang get ready to transfer. Well, not me, but tran, 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 travel. God dang it. Uh, travel to uh, Ames, Iowa, and parts unknown as uh, Sooners get ready to take on Iowa State. Uh, Josh McQuiston is here. We got some recruiting stuff breaking just before the show that is interesting to talk about. Uh, meanwhile, Eddie and I are doing manly things around the office together. Well, like no, a father and son <laughs> it's, duo. It, it's like it's like Carrie's doing a lot of stuff, and I'm just saying, okay, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? And then he tries to explain. I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's, sure, let's do that. <laughs> it was really like I'm sure you were. We got some, power tools. At, I mean, it's at some point yesterday you were like, why is this man sweating so much? He's only getting up and down a ladder it would be, it would be very good scoop hd video we need i i mean i know that you said that we needed a documentary crew a couple weeks ago yeah uh it, they wouldn't have been bad to be around here yesterday oh my god like climbing ladders we're putting up the we're, we're still in the conference room this week uh we had electricians out this weekend we're, we're putting in and here's like this is what had me concerned so i show bob what we're doing last week and the first thing he says is is that going to stay up there? Like, it's lighting hanging from the ceiling. I was like, yeah, it's going to stay up there. He's like, and then you said that, and then I start climbing up there and looking at how strong it is and second-guessing myself. And, like, because last thing I want is, like, build something that falls on you guys and hurts somebody, and then Josh and I are out a lot of money. Well, that, that's my dream. That's what I want to happen. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to pay for you to be an invalid, though. I mean, that, Well, I don't know if, if we it can get help much it. worse with uh, brain issues these days. So, uh, And so then we're finishing up, like, we're putting these two rails yesterday, and Eddie t- turns to me afterwards because he saw, he saw some stuff, man. Like, he saw some stuff not work right. And as he's walking out, he's like, and I'm showing him, like, what's going to be hanging up there. And he looks at me and goes, that's not going to fall on us, is it? <laughs> it, I, I, it makes is sense, it? though. It's going to look good. It's going to look really good when it gets all said and done. So, yeah, now I, brought, I went out and got a new stud finder that is even more exact. And I've got longer screws to make sure that everything is even more secure. So, yeah, it's going to be cool when it's done. So that's, that's your office update. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a project, just like uh, the Oklahoma football team as we enter week eight. It's about, right? how, it's about how we finish. That's right. That's right. We're just trying to get better week to week. Yeah, I'd say yesterday was a TCU-type performance from our work <laughs> in the office. Let's hope we don't have I a don't Texas know. I, staring I think ahead. we still won the game. I mean, yeah. it, uh, you know, we'll see. So, uh, I mean, yeah, let's just get into it. I mean, uh, back to kind of uh, Brent kind of taking things off of players. That's kind of the message uh, this week is, is getting them ready for game day, which is what we said, you know, that's your job as a coach to get the players ready to play their best on game day. It's not about – I feel like Kenny Powers. I'm not about winning exercise. And, uh, it's like you're not there to be – have your best practices and then not play on Sunday – so it seems like even though he's kind of kind of been sheepish sheepish about it a yeah. little bit like he's he I mean it's pretty obvious he he realized they need to change some things. Well, I thought the the number one thing that we got from Jeff Levy and Ted Roof and then you could even go into Brent and some of the stuff that he said on Tuesday was uh it was last week during the bye week they only practiced three times. It was a lot mm-hmm. of uh mental rest, mental. a lot of physical rest and even more so just self-evaluation was the word that I think all three of those guys used and I, you know, it didn't really send a whole lot of uh, shockwaves out there just as far as what Brent said on Tuesday about it. But I thought one of the things that I walked away there from him saying was uh, an answer to Barry Trammell's question, just about self-evaluation and stuff they got out of it. And he flat out said it can't be football 24 Mm seven. And, you know, I think that's when you look back at the rough patch that they did have a month ago, it all kind of goes into this idea that everybody was just mentally drained from the, from August and from everything that had happened over the last 10 months. So, you know, we'll see. Are they going to be refreshed? Are they going to be reset when they head up to Ames this weekend? Uh, we shall see. But, you know, it's week eight, and I have no idea what to expect as Oklahoma goes up to Jack Trice, a one-point favorite on Saturday. And neither does Venables. He, yeah. he copied us. He copied our answer about how they could win all five or they could lose all five of 
of of these games and how he's not maddened by it, which I'm sure a lot of fans are, but he's like, you got to respect the game, and that starts with practice. That starts with the mental prep and the way that they've attacked it the the last couple of weeks. And, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to see anything really different based on, like, X's and O's and personnel. It's just it's got to start with a mindset first. By the way, uh, I, I forgot to tell you guys before you leave here today, I have some self-evaluation surveys that you're going to fill out. Good. We need it. <laughs> want, want you to take a good hard look at the uh-huh. jobs that you're doing? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, any, no, anyway, but I mean, yeah, it, it is kind of weird because everything's kind of put to bed now, you know, around noonish on Tuesdays. Uh, so it's a little bit of a... I don't know, a load off of the players to not... I mean, it's not like they're not giving us players to talk to. No, we're getting plenty of guys. We're getting plenty of guys Monday. But with Brent going Tuesday, I mean, you're sort of joking, but I would have asked someone about the self-evaluation. Yeah, sure, exactly. So that's something we're not getting to follow up on anything that happens after Brent. It it will be interesting, though. And, you know, it was something that Ted Roof talked about on Monday, just as far as... You know, how much can Robert Spears Jennings play into this? We'll see about Billy Bowman. I, you know, Bob, I think we kind of disagree. I think he's going to play this weekend. Uh, we'll see. Just the way that, and I base a lot of that off of knowing that he's practicing right now. It was good to see DeMont Harmon's practicing again, mm-hmm. uh, just because of the scary incident that he had down in Fort Worth. But, you know, if, if they can just get Billy Bowman back there, I think it's going to calm everything down in the secondary. Hopefully you get... Key Lawrence alongside Billy Bowman back there. Key Lawrence probably coming off one of his better games of the year against Kansas. Of his career. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll go there with you. It it just, uh, you know, we'll see. Just some of the stuff that he was doing just in the time that we were out there on Monday night. It's like, this guy looks like he, I mean, he was cutting and doing things, running around. I just would have a hard time thinking that, you know, he wouldn't be able to play, but who knows? Because Brent definitely downplayed it on on Tuesday just as far as his availability. You know, I'd be curious to, you know, get kind of somebody, uh, a true opinion of like what that's meant for Key Lawrence getting that start against Kansas because he was a guy that obviously wasn't practicing well uh, and then started developing those habits, got a start out of the deal. Like, what's the last two weeks been like for him? And and is he a guy that we're going to start seeing as a – you know, a consistent contributor because we all know that the guy's got the talent. Well, and if nothing else, I think it's more so just a thing of maybe building a little bit more confidence, getting him out there, getting him more snaps, and, you know, just flat out being healthier coming off of the hamstring thing that kind of nagged him for, you know, basically about a month. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, I think it's important for the fans to see, and this is, let's face it, this is the worst offense in the Big 12 they're getting ready to face in Iowa State. It's important for the fans to see, because I think a lot of people are still split. Like if you ask the guy off the street, they'll say the defense was still terrible, you know, against Kansas. Yeah. Where it, forty-two points, I can't really argue that. But like Josh, we talked about that. Like the finer points of it, there were positives. There were baby steps taken by the defense in the last timeout. Yeah, there really were. And to me, this guys, it feels like the break, the opponent coming out of it. That was, it's the perfect recipe for Oklahoma. Like it really should be Oklahoma's not going to, they can't just go win this game 65 to 55. Like Iowa state's not going to allow them to play that game. Like there's just no way. So, but at the same time, if Oklahoma's defense is just sound, they don't have to be special. They don't have to be great. They can keep Iowa state maybe, you know, in check, build a little confidence and then start, you know, kind of running that final stretch of the big of Big Twelve play, but you know, you go out and look bad against Iowa State, you've got real, real problems. I mean, this is this is a bad offense. That's well, why it, it is. Go ahead, Bob. Were you going to say it? Just like the matchup with OU offensively and what Iowa State presents, they're obviously a very good defense yet again. Uh, you know, the top ten scoring defense in the country. They lead. You know, Brent made a note of it yesterday at his press conference. They lead the uh, Big 12 in four different categories. The four main ones. If you can if you can go up there, be able to run the ball and get a good performance for, you know, a second game in a row from Dylan Gabriel, find some things over the top, get the throwing game going. Uh it's a positive. You got to clean up the turnovers though because that is one of the things that looking back at the Kansas game that put you in your defense in really bad positions, giving them a short field and 
obviously Oklahoma is not good enough defensively to get themselves out of trouble. Here's a question for you at, at, at Iowa State, just talking about lineups and defense. C.J. Colden get the start at corner? I'm torn because it's not like Jaden Davis has been playing poorly. Right. He just hasn't done anything like C.J. has during the last couple of weeks. But I think you see a lot, a lot more run, and I think that led – I firmly believe that led in the part of D.J. Graham m- moving over – C.J. Colden, the way that he's been playing. 100%. He's, he's going to get more snaps, and if that's your three-man rotation with Woody, Jaden, C.J., I think I mean, he'll I, I will I, say I, this. I he'll take it. I, I like Jaden Davis out there better as, as a run support sure. than I do Colden. Sure, but at the same time, and maybe, you know, I depending on, you know, Xavier Hutchinson and the throwing game, yeah. I want a guy that can get his hands on the football, and C.J. Colden's at least shown the ability – to get his head around and at least make some type of play on the football. You well, need someone to be, be very physical with Hutchinson. Yeah. Even the Texas interception, like how many times have we just said, like, why why doesn't OU get – we watch another football game and a quarterback throws a duck and a guy just – it's right to a corner. Like how many times have we said, how come that never happens to OU on defense? And, that, and So, like, it happened to C.J. Holden, but it's like – do you? I, I want to give the guy credit because we, we don't see that very often. I just want one time this year to look up and a ball is tipped at the line of scrimmage and an OU defender just happens to be there. Yep. I feel like every Saturday <laughs> we come back to the office, turn on games, and people are just creating turnovers, getting hands on footballs. It just never happens. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of good stuff, like tackles for losses seem like they're coming back a little bit. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, and it might speak to what they were doing for the first couple of weeks, but, and it shows just how massive the drop-off was, but they're still top 20 in the country in tackles for loss yeah. right now, which, I don't know, depending, you know, you look at the uh, Kansas State, Texas, TCU games, you would think they would have dropped out of the top 50. Well, it's funny about Kansas, they had a bunch of them, but a lot. Almost every single one of them, except for the sack, was a one-yard loss. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, I mean, when you tackle a receiver on a screen for a one-yard loss, that's you're, you're getting after it defensively. I know – I think Jaden Davis had one of those. Uh, but, I mean, that was the thing. Like, like, the run fits, like we keep talking about. Like, they were just better in that game. Yeah. And what – it doesn't really show on the scoreboard because in the second half, there were 100 plays offensively for OU in that game. So – like, the defense just wore down. And, and like we said, it's also that mentality of, oh, crap, here we go again. Yeah, and the tackling has to be better. Out. And, you know, it's, it's all a work in progress. But just take baby steps. Take baby steps with this thing. And I think everybody, uh, you know, will look up at the scoreboard in the fourth quarter, and you should be pretty happy about it on Saturday. I, I, I agree with Josh. This is a game that if you're going to – They can't be in the 30s. No. Iowa State cannot be in the 30s. No, but if you're going to come out of this bye week and you're going to set the groundwork for these last five games and finish how they want, you should go up there and, you know, you should have a comfortable victory. I, I you know, we'll, we'll see. I just – I have no idea what to expect. Well, and I think part of it is health-wise. I mean, what's the feel on how healthy this team – I mean, obviously they didn't practice a lot last week. I mean, to me, this is more about getting guys back that have been banged up. As you said, maybe a, a, a Billy Bowman, maybe. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else has just been well, like, you know, banged up. Wood, like Woody Washington's been dealing with the shoulder stuff. Yeah. Wanya Morris. Just stuff that didn't keep them off the field, but it kept them from being who we know they can be. I, I mean, I, like Marcus Major, where is he? Like the- that's a that's a great question that probably needs to be explored a little bit. Just as far as he was suited up mm-hmm. on Saturday against Kansas and just never got any run. Like this is, I'm wondering if he came back too fast for Texas. Yeah, we've been so waiting. We've been waiting three years now, down. though, for Marcus Major to have some type of breakout. And it just seems like there's always something. Mm-hmm. It's time. Like, it's, if it's you're going to be the number since... two back, you got to start producing, or I'm ready to give the carries to Javante Barnes, who's been good yeah. in limited experience. To me, Javante Barnes just seems like a guy that needs to get used to the college game. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, he's going to be really good, but he doesn't know, like, how much of an advantage he has size-wise. Sure. Uh, I think he, he, he kind of 
Uh, he, he definitely read some blocks wrong. Yeah, he, where he could have had some really he's, nice. He's games. making some decisions that you know he's they're going to be better in the future, but he's overthinking things a little bit. You can just see it, Josh. I don't know how you feel about just watching Barnes and what he can be, what versus he is right now. Oh, I mean, he just guys when he flashes. I mean, the stuff is it, uh, there's nobody. I mean, as good as Eric Gray is playing. Javante Barnes does some things Eric Gray just can't do. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say that. But at the same time, like, he had one guy, and I, I highlighted it in um, The Idiot last week, where he reads it. it it's, 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 um, it's just a read play, and he's got a cutback lane up the middle, or he's, got, or he's supposed to, the way the play is designed. And he cuts it back inside and doesn't read it outside outside. He's got 20 yards yep. probably. Mm-hmm. There were and a couple you can times. literally yep. hear DeMarco Murray on the broadcast go, no, stay with it or something like that. Like you can clearly hear someone on the sideline, like, no, you read that wrong. And so it's, it, it really is. I mean, like that's, that's the stuff. That's the growing pains that you, that comes with all that. But I mean, he is like, I, I was a huge fan of Barnes in high school, but he's been better than I thought he would be because he looks so twitchy and so explosive. Like every play looks like, man, he could he could really pop something here. And it, it's just about getting a feel for it. Cause I mean, that's what you can tell right now is he is he's just kind of running running around. I mean, I don't know of a better way to say it. Like he doesn't have the feel for, okay, if this guy gets this side of the block or he's got the edge here, I can follow that around. Like there's just, it's little stuff. It's nuanced that you can only learn with repetition and that kind of stuff. But there's, I mean, to me watching all the backs that have come through, I mean, he's the most talented back OU's had since Joe Mixon, in my opinion. And the, you know, and the thing about it is like you watch the progression, you talked about how long we've been waiting for Marcus major. You go back to that Cotton Bowl uh, when they played Florida. That was the game where you're like, okay, this kid might be something. And granted, it was against a Florida team that what didn't want to be there. JV squad, Dan Mullen. Yeah, mm-hmm. Dan Mullen. Well, he's on ESPN talking about him now. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think with Major, it's like it's, it's so disappointing because it seemed like he was finally getting to the place where he was a really effective runner between the tackles, like just on the verge of taking that next step and then nothing. Yeah, yeah. If he doesn't get run this this game, because he's got to be healthy at at this point. I there's part of me that thinks maybe he rushed to get back for for Texas, and not saying he got banged up, but he just was a hundred percent. So you suit him for Kansas, but you don't plan on playing him. But then you go to bye week, and if he's not playing this week, then you know Barnes has just become the number two guy. And with all that said, I mean, Eric Gray's been phenomenal. He's leading oh, yeah. the country right now in yards per carry. I feel like I now have to turn into how dare you uh, anytime anybody doesn't give Eric Gray enough credit because I was <laughs> such shit on him for so long. He, he's been exceptional. I mean, he, he's been really yep. good. And you look at the Kansas game, Josh, I know that you made a couple notes about this in the uh, Monday morning idiot just as far as the the amount of guys that he made miss in the second level that opened up a play that was going to be seven yards to 14 yards. He was really, really good. Oh, he was outstanding. I mean, and that, to me, guys, that's what's interesting about this weekend. Like, Oklahoma got to build a little con- – it's it's kind of the reverse of the Kansas game where that offense was good, the defense, you thought, okay, Oklahoma should have some success here, and clearly they did. This needs to be a week where the defense takes a step forward and the offense just doesn't, you know, doesn't get overwhelmed. Just plays a solid game tries to get upper 20s, low 30s, and I think you get out of there with a win. But it's just, uh, you know, can Eric, can this offense consistently run the ball against an Iowa State front four that's probably as good as anybody they've faced so far? I mean, Will McDonald's a monster. He's going to give them some problems. The nice thing for Oklahoma is if, if you were going to pick an area for Oklahoma to be attacked right now, you'd say it's on the edges. Like Anton Harrison and Wanya Morris – are playing good football and they are better equipped to deal than if, Oh, you know, like next week when Baylor comes to town and you've got to deal with the big man in the middle, I, that, that, that's going to get tricky and that's going to create some, some issues for Oklahoma. So, you know, we'll see where that goes obviously in a week, but this feels like a matchup that sets up pretty well for Oklahoma, but, I mean, with this team and how all over the place they've been, it's it's hard to 
take that to the bank or anything or to assume anything's true. You know, it's it, it's kind of funny, too, when we talk about Oklahoma getting to the 30s this weekend. The most points Iowa State's allowed this year is 31 to Baylor. Yeah, I mean, they're like, a good mm-hmm. defense. I mean, they are right. damn good defense. You mentioned uh, – you know, we were just kind of talking about guys that are, are standing out here and there. Let's talk a little kind of mid-season awards kind of stuff. I mean, like, I – I was thinking, like, I was thinking we would all write something down, but that's hard to do when we're all talking. Uh, I wrote down who I think my biggest surprise is on the team uh, this season. Biggest surprise, as in, like, good? just w- wasn't <laughs> you expecting want good individual player that has impressed me more than anyone else. On all, it's hard to do one for defense, but yeah, on offense. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I. I could, think it's an obvious. It, it, there's an obvious choice. Is it Braden Willis? No, that's a good one. No, he's the heart, the, the heart, the heart and, soul. and soul. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if people on the board hear that one more time, they're going to lose it. But I do think it's like, it's a great story. I mean, he's turned in, he's he's kind of turned himself into one of those guys that is, you know, obviously, I, Brent even said it on uh, Tuesday, just as far as scouts are talking about him. Uh, yeah. He's making kind of a wave in which probably wasn't there for himself. A, you know, a smart decision to come back. Uh, it just never made any sense to me. How he wasn't better. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just the measurables, the the size. I mean, it was almost like last year, and I, I kind of talked to him about this after the game that they like, yep. he just seemed like like a little boy in a man, a grown man's body. Like, he didn't, he didn't understand he was bigger and faster and stronger than everybody else. And he played kind of to avoid people instead of just, you know, take people head on. Like, you remember, I think it was the Oklahoma State game. Like, he had like a catch and he like, kind of like jump cuts and stuff like i'm like just run through the guy yeah no no he's definitely more confident in what he's doing and i think he used the word i'm just playing more free to Mm -hmm. you yeah and you can definitely see that like he he's done an exceptional job who are you gonna say though jalil farouk okay i I want more is it is it wrong to say i I want more but i mean you've got all these guys at receiver and he's the guy that they've really you know, started drawing up plays for, especially like, you know, the, the quick hitters and, mm-hmm. and yards after the catch stuff, like reverses jets and stuff like that. Like they just use him so well, but he's, he surprised me with how athletic and fast he is. I mean, like Theo Weiss never did that for me. Like yeah. he's just a good route runner, a good receiver when he catches the ball. Uh, I'm thinking Iowa state again, last time they were up there, that was not a good day for him. Uh, but like I was good, I was happy to see Theo get involved in the Kansas game. Like I want to see him because I think he's a guy that stuck with it and deserves it. Uh, but to me, yeah, Jalil Farouk has been the biggest surprise to me because I didn't, I didn't expect him to become pretty much the number two receiver. It's at such, this point in the season. it's such like almost a little bit of a cop out, but you can only base like this offense off of what we've seen with Dylan Gabriel out yeah. there. Yeah. Like, Again, mm-hmm. that's that's half of the except for half Eric of the Gray. Six, half I mean, of the seven games already. You know, Eric Gray and Braden Willis. I mean, sure. Running sure, the Wildcat sure. against Texas. Yeah. They they were the only ones that gave him a chance to get up and down the field. It feels like the 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 throwing games coming together a little bit more. I mean you get Marvin Mims obviously very involved against Kansas with the 16 targets. Uh everything just moves so much more smoothly. Uh, in the Kansas game, and if you can get that Dylan, Ga- like if you can get the Dylan Gabriel that played against Kansas, where again he missed a couple throws, but that's so much more useful than what you were getting in some of the stuff that he missed before, and even going back to the first quarter of the TCU game where it was just flat out awful. Josh, what do you think? The most surprising, got you know I, I don't know that I have one that screams at me. But I'll own it. I mean, again, Kerry kind of came with the how dare you. Eric Gray. It's Eric great. Gray it is a great. much yes. better player than I had ever given him credit for. Like, and I'll, you know, I'll own that all day. That, that he I'm has, the same. I, I don't shy away from having because we saw who, he, cold who he was in 2021. We're like, why were they so excited about getting this guy? I still don't <laughs> think you run him between the tackles on fourth and one from the goal line. Or fourth and goal, you know, yeah, and from the one. Yep. That was something that, you know, Jeff talked about on Monday, obviously, just as far as they should have put him in a better situation, spread him out a little bit more, given themselves a more of an opportunity as, instead of just trying to. Well, they had the touchdown until the, was it the timeout or the penalty? 
because they were going to run a boot with Gabriel. He was going to walk in. I, it was the timeout. Timeout. Yeah, yeah it was, yeah, like it was a timeout. A timeout. And it's like, mm, they, it's like, uh-oh, we showed our hand. But then they, they did run the boot, and or not really the boot, but the fake, and they scored. On, on fourth down. Uh, yeah, uh, on fourth following. Down. Yeah. And the, it, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but like that that when they got inside the uh, three yard line there before halftime, that's where it's like just run the run the uh, the wildcat stuff. Get, yeah, get well, and that was my there. my question coming out of Texas. Like, will we ever see that again? They did some direct snaps to Eric Gray yeah. against Kansas, but just full blown wildcat. Like, I think they should. I don't think they should shy away from using that. Maybe they have to have Davis Bevel on the field. Maybe he's the key to the wildcat. <laughs> He stands the furthest away the best. Oh, you kill me. <laughs> Poor guy. By That's the way, never for by the way, I, that game. from a uh, from a well known uh, friend of the podcast, I heard that uh, there were rumblings that Davis Bevel was at Logie's last weekend, and uh, his classmates were not too kind to oh, him. Is no. what I what I heard. No matter how bad you suck on a football field, you should be able to go to a bar on campus without getting any grief, mm, unless you're losing people money. <laughs> what? Like, like what if, happened was Davis Bevel's fault. I know. Like, no, I know. He, he, that that was just never a position he was gonna succeed in. Like that that's not on him. Sure. Which we I know you're need. messing around, but like that that's that's so lame. Like come on. Like we, I I realize like we're critics as a profession almost, but come on. Like let a guy go have a beer and chill out. Like don't be that way. Is there one guy on defense that we can say? Like no. he's been a surprise. We've I, had him after like three games. Negative. A- after three games, we're feeling good. Stutzman, Grimes, like all right. All right, no, I'll, I'll really no. dig for this. What about Isaiah Co? Doesn't play enough. Uh, okay. To, doesn't even qualify. Yeah. It's like <laughs> the Michael, not enough Michael Turk <laughs> punting thing. He, he does. He hasn't punted it enough to really qualify for anything. Well, does this have to be a positive surprise? Like this uh, has to be great. Come on, we don't want doom and gloom. I. I mean, Woody Washington, yeah. like, I thought Woody Washington was going to have a great year. I, I really thought it was going to be, and I mean, I realized some of it's just the TCU game. You just can't get it out of your brain, but I, I like, that's not like people can say, oh yeah, he, he spent a years under Roy Manning. Roy Manning was not teaching him to grab somebody the second the ball was in the air. Like that, that's not how that works. I mean, if we, uh, nobody in his high school taught him to do that. Like I, I don't know. Like it just, you you wonder at some point, like if they just have to flush almost everything and start over. Cause like Woody is a talented guy that played a high level of high school football, like should, and has made big plays for OU, but man, that panic was concerning to see. I'll nominate the entire linebacking core. Uh, yeah. if we really want to get negative on this thing. I actually go corners. Cause they don't, they're not even around to like do anything. Yeah, but the the linebackers have just they're during their you know the dark period <laughs> is what we'll just call it the three game stretch <laughs> they were so terrible the angles like I and you know I love the guy but Danny Stutzman hasn't been good at times now I thought he was better against Kansas but it's a very vanilla I'd offense. say aguebu has been worse than Stutzman though yeah one hundred percent one hundred percent agree and which you know. Again, that kind of goes back to just preseason expectation, and I, you know, we, I, I think that hand up, we talked ourselves into thinking that he was going to be much better, and I think a lot of it had to do with well, Brent's back on the sideline, like everything was going to be okay, and it just simply isn't. I mean, I, 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 I would guys, say if if I want to give one positive, it'd be the CJ Colden. I mean, I mean, yeah. a guy just. You, know, you, you don't mm-hmm. see anything bad from sure. him. You've seen a couple of picks, and sure, one was easy to get. But, uh, you know, he's just a guy that I didn't expect much out of. And really, you know, in the Texas game, I was kind of like, when he had the interception, I, was, uh, I, I can't remember where that guy transferred in from. Well, it was just a weird decision for him to stay at Wyoming instead of coming in for spring. Yeah, Cause it was. Because he, he had to work. You know, he admitted, like, I was so far behind him. I don't want to say, well, yeah, you put yourself there. <laughs> well, all right. Well, how about, you know, this is definitely a strength. And, you know, it's kind of awkward because he's been out a couple of weeks. But Billy Bowen's been great. When he's yep. been on the yeah. field, he's been yep. everything he's been that so you thought good. he was going to be. He's been so good that at TCU, they fell apart without him. Yeah. Yeah. It, Bill, and, Billy Bowman might be the best safety in the conference. Like, he, he's play, he was playing at that kind of level. 
better than like a, I don't know, better than Jason Taylor. I mean, I, I like I love Jason Taylor. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I hate that he. What what is he out for good? I haven't seen anything. I'm they, sure I just missed it. They haven't announced anything, but his mom put so, something up that just said it was like a meniscus hyper uh, hyper extension. Uh, yeah. So okay. I mean, yeah. You know. Oh, Gundy's but, I mean, on a he, big. I won't talk about injuries rant yeah. right now. Yeah. Sweet. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, he he's real hurt. Okay. Um. But no, you know, I mean, and again, I, I, I'm not saying he absolutely is, but I think he's in that conversation. I mean, I, I think he, and again, it was a few games. You don't want to go crazy or anything like that. Just to balance my force out here a little bit. I know I kind of interrupted Eddie and so I'll do it quickly. Grayson Halton has been a nice surprise. I, he's had some nice moments on the field as a freshman. Like I didn't expect to see him at all this year. I, I wasn't over the moon about him in high school. I kind of wasn't sure how he'd fit, but I, I he's flashed some good stuff. Yeah, and, and I, I think that, you know, for the same matter, like if you want to talk about flashing, you can you can name a lot of the freshmen. Yes. Jaron Canick, or Mason mm-hmm. Thomas, obviously, mm-hmm. who we talked to on two, uh, Monday night. Awesome. That guy is going to be awesome in the uh, interview room, you know, during midweek and mm-hmm. after games and stuff. He's he, he just You can just tell that, Comes from a great program. He gets it. He knows what he needs to do. Uh, you know, Gentry Williams has been okay at times. Uh, you Kip Lewis in the in the very very small amounts that we've seen him, he's at least made plays. Yeah, I mean, we just have to see so much more. Yeah, those like guys. those are. I'm talking very small sample yeah. size for some of those guys. Sure, that shows you how far we're reaching to find. Oh guys yeah, on yes. no, one hundred percent. I mean, one hundred percent. You got you got to drag the barrel, man. You you laid it out in front of us. Robert Spears Jennings, another one that's had some nice moments. But his so. hit on Bean was one of the best of the entire season. Yeah, it was it was it was shocking to see a guy, <laughs> and it was still like a six yard. Game. Yes, it was. Like, okay, <laughs> but it was really like. Did my eyes see what I just saw? No, like, it, it was it, three. It's like, yeah. holy shit, that's a safety. And it's like that, that was play. clean. That yeah. wasn't late. That was absolutely, you're allowed to do, do that. All right. Uh, by the way, uh, no, no matter what your kitchen is like, uh, there is a way for you to have a restaurant quality meal, and that is through primeshrimp.com. P R I M E shrimp.com. Uh, no thawing, no mess, no fuss. All you do is you pick your uh, your flavor. You can go with the signature season, the French Quarter Alfredo, my favorite, the garlic herb butter, probably my number two on my chart right now, uh, Louisiana shrimp boil. You can get the Simply Shrimp if you want to season uh, your own. It's unseasoned. And then they got the new lemon and cracked pepper uh, that is out. And I know Josh is one of us that has had that so far. Uh, and uh, all you do is go to primeshrimp.com, pick out that flavor in less than 10 minutes. All you do is you put it in boiling water, less than 10 minutes, uh, they're done. You can pair them with whatever you want maybe. Uh, some rice or quinoa or uh, what's a quino uh, or uh, anything, you know, uh, pasta, whatever you like. Uh, peeled and packed in the U.S., 100% satisfaction guarantee. Uh, if you don't love the shrimp, they'll give you a full refund. Uh, and also, you use the promo code Sooner Scoop, you will get a twenty. Do- you get twenty dollars off your first order from PrimeShrimp.com. You can bundle and save. Uh, with the, uh, their six packs, you can uh, just variety, get whatever you want, try it all. Uh, but yeah, lots of Sooner Scoopers have got in on this. Use that code Sooner Scoop, uh, and you'll get $20 off your first order. PrimeShrimp.com. Go check them out. One more strength that we probably need to highlight because it has been something of a strength for Oklahoma. Just special teams in general, really, really solid. Zach yeah. Schmidt's been good. Kickoff return's been good at times. It, it's mm-hmm. all been solid enough. Uh, outside of like the kick return defense on the one against Kansas OU State, Billy Bowman. But yeah, I mean, and that wasn't necessarily anybody's fault as much as it was just he got hit in the leg. And yeah. uh, but they've been good. It's been solid. You can't bitch about it in a game in which you're only favored by a point and a half going up to Ames. I would imagine that you're going to need to have a good special teams, right? It's hurt him in the past. I mean, and I, you know, it's it will be interesting because you know. Dylan Gabriel did go to Nebraska, played well. It's almost like until this last week, he played worse at home. Like, almost being at home was a little bit of pressure on him. It's going to be, you know, I don't know if it's going to be raucous in Ames. I mean, it's 11 a.m. game. 11 a.m., you're three and four. not going that well. Like, it'll probably be – it probably won't be a crazy crowd. You just want to find the rhythm that they did against Kansas. Like, that was the first time that you looked up in the first quarter, and it was like, okay, this offense is moving. They're finding ways to move the football – 
despite you know having to go back out there and answer a couple times there early. That's exactly what their their crowd will be like if the OU Kansas crowd got you know more excited as they saw the offense start mm-hmm. performing well. If Iowa State comes out setting the world on fire, then that Ames crowd will actually be be something. And, you know, it, Josh, if Dylan Gabriel has another Kansas-like performance minus the turnovers, I, I mean, I think he he suddenly vaults himself into the type of quarterback that, you know, if he comes back next year and continues to play well this year, like he's back in that discussion of, uh, you know, a potential elite quarterbacks in the country. Because, I mean, yeah. putting up that 400 yards, that was impressive. That was a different I, I quarterback think, for, to, to me, oh, to my 100%. eyes. Oh, 100%. That was so much better than anything we'd seen from him. There, there's really no I, – I talked about it last week. His timing was better. I felt like he felt pressure better. Uh, just did a lot of the little stuff that keeps drives moving. You know, we, we talked about it in those first few – you know, the as Eddie calls it, the dark times. That Kansas State game, like we talk about penalties, but he also took some sacks and stuff mm-hmm. where you were just like, get rid of that ball, man. Like you, you – like and it just – it's the same effect. I mean, you, you not only did you lose the yardage, you also lost the down. So th- there were just different things happening, and I thought he was much better. But, yeah, I mean, I don't think he's ever going to be in that C.J. Stroud, Caleb Williams, Bryce Young tier, but he could be in that next group, like that next group of – man, you can win a title with these guys. And I'm not saying that's what OU is going to do, but I'm just saying these are very good quarterbacks. You can win anything you need to win with these guys – and what do you have around them? I mean, he, he's definitely – he needs players around him to go to the level that, you know, OU fans expect OU to be at. No doubt. And it, it's just funny that, like – and it, it probably – we've talked about this before and just how spoiled Oklahoma has been at the quarterback position. But you look at his numbers and he's thrown for, what, 16-18, 13 touchdowns to one interception, uh, 13th nationally in pass efficiency – uh, 13th nationally in yards per completion at 14.2. That leads to the Big 12. 10th in yards per pass attempt. It It's not terrible. No. It's just not to that level of what everybody's been used to. And obviously, he's he ha- there has been moments where he just hasn't been good. He's missed guys. I want to see them be able to extend the field a little bit. Can they, can they get something down the field to Marvin Mims one time? I mean, that's what, what's kind of interesting is like, you know, he is he's found people more than we are used to quarterbacks finding people the last couple of years yeah. like downfield um but have they and in in traffic like i don't know if that's you know like josh don't you when you watch like and i know it's not a great example right now because he just lost but like you watch quinn ewers kind of throw people open like he can sense where guys are going into coverages and coming out of coverages and deliver the football like are you seeing some of that from Dylan Gabriel maybe that you didn't see from some of these young quarterbacks OU's had the last couple of years? A little bit because he's, he's got such a feel for the offense. He has a sense for it. And he knows, okay, against this, we're going to react like this, and this is what he should do. And I feel like part of it that doesn't get enough credit is I feel like the communication, you know, we've talked about the defense not communicating very well. I think the offense has done a pretty nice job with it, especially in the passing game where you're not – because. I mean, obviously, all these guys are making, you know, reads and adjustments and they're doing all these things in real time. But yet you haven't seen a lot of this with a new offense where, oh, the receiver was going this way and Gabriel read it that way. You know, like it seems like they're all pretty well on the same page. And I think that's a, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't think obviously that's a good sign. So I think you're seeing some of that. At the same time, I think with viewers and guys like that, Kerry, you know, Caleb Williams is a good example where they they're so talented they're willing to take those risks sometimes well i think it's not that gabriel's not talented i think he knows who he is like i think he knows that i'm not the guy that's going to thread the needle 30 yards down the field like he, he's going to take what's there what's available and like i said he knows he's got enough talent around him with guys like mims and farouk and gray and all these guys he can get the ball to like i don't have to be a superhero i'm gonna let them make plays and I think that's more of what I see compared to Rattler and Caleb, who I felt like always wanted to be the superhero, like had to make the throw 
that nobody else could make. And at times they could do it because they were so gifted with their arms, but it also led them to some terrible decisions, especially, you know, I mean, Spencer Rattler is still making some of these awful decisions. <laughs> That's why I'm intrigued with Dylan for this week with the rush three drop eight. How patient yeah. is, is he going to be, be able to be when you know you're probably not going to be able to stretch the field? Are you going to be okay just doing it 10, 12 yards at a time instead of like a 40, 50? you know, 50 yard chunk play. And as much as we, you know, and talking about Eric Gray and how well the Oklahoma has been able to run the ball, the next five games are against defensive lines and defensive fronts that are going to present a much better challenge than Kansas did. But you know what? Uh, OU's always been able to run the ball well against Iowa state. It's just that I think under the former coach, like he didn't, he didn't press that enough. He, he yeah. tried to He'd throw go, it too much. He'd go yeah. away from it all the time. He was, I mean, he was always that guy that, and it was like Iowa State the last time, maybe it was last year, where it's like they had like six straight run plays Kennedy at the end Brooks. of the game. Yep. Kennedy Brooks, mm -hmm. like, and you're like, where? Like Jeff Levy's gonna stick with that run. Like if they got a three, if they got, you know, their standard five or six man front, like he's gonna he's gonna try and run the ball. Uh, he's he, he's gonna read the box and say this is a run play. Kennedy Brooks carried the ball 17 times for 115 yards uh, last year against Iowa State. It was like the second to last drive where he had like six or seven straight carries, and they still needed Brock Purdy to throw a terrible pass that Pat, that uh, Pat Fields could pick off to save the the win. That was a uh, Caleb's outing. That that ooh. the OU three that yard line with gross. fifteen seconds. Yes. Left. Yep. That, I just I <laughs> and he I, was open too. I had it. I, I had not. I did not remember that until yep. mm -hmm. just now. Well, and that was like, you know, the Nebraska game early in the year when they ended up sacking Martinez. Like, you just thought it was going to be like that again. Like, they were too far away. They didn't have enough time. And then all of a sudden, you realize, oh, shit, Brock Purdy's done this before. Like We've been through some shit, guys. Like, <laughs> been, yeah, I mean, we're, there's been some games that they just – it it, it truly, like, it, the further you get away from it, it's like, how the hell did they find a way to win that game? And – they're back to the defensive, you know, mentality, the letdown. Like, yeah. You know, how much they're affected by things going bad. Because so. it's the same personnel. I mean, if, if we feel it, imagine what they feel. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, shit. Here we go again. No, but I, I, that's the most intriguing part about it to me is I want to see how committed Jeff Levy really is to the run. And, and I think he will be more than what we've been used to seeing. So. And the weather should be nice. Like it's it. There's not going to be any yeah. Rain should be or like, like low that, so. low sixties or high fifties. No 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 it's a issues. Messed up weather report because it's going to be cold in the morning, but kind of nice in the afternoon. So you don't really know what to wear. Well, you'll be riding Guys. in style thanks to Eskridge Lexus. Absolutely. Oh no. Okay, I, I, I want enough to read. Sure, get it. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> No, I thought I was in. I was like, I'm interrupting the Eskridge read, but no, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, you, no, no uh, you would be interrupting the dead Soxy read because uh, correct dead uh, <laughs> is where you want to go for your socks. Put a sock in it. Put a sock in it, Josh. Uh, yeah, we should do that segment from now. You'd probably be more like put a sock in it, Carrie. Uh, but Dead Soxy, they've been featured all over the place because they're big time now, man. Uh, Men's Health, Forbes, Men's Journal, GQ. Uh, made for the hustle. Uh, they got the true stay technology, so no matter how much you got to run around the, during the day uh, at work, your socks are not going to fall down. Uh, buttery soft fabrics, uh, and of course, the no-shows. Uh, what uh, they have kind of become famous for, uh, and they're just as buttery soft. Like, you forget you even have socks on. You just know your feet aren't sweating like crazy uh, like they do if you don't have socks on. But great dress socks. Uh, they've got the, uh, the, the college colors collection too. So you can get your crimson and cream socks, uh, the team colorways, but go check them out. Use the promo code scoop and you'll get 25% off your entire order. That's a uh, scoop, your promo code that you want to use 25% off your, your entire order. So go check them out. Deadsoxy.com, D E A D S O X Y.com. And as always stay soxy. All right, uh, should we switch Jackson to, Arnold time? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we. I think we are. Yeah, you know, there's some recruiting news out there that's popping today that I think everybody's going to be probably on the boards right now, freaking out about it right now, Josh. But uh, let's start there as uh, 
reports surfacing that the OU commit uh, is going to take a visit to Georgia. Yeah, uh, on three uh, reporting, and I, I believe Jerry Hamilton of on three is reporting that Anthony Evans is going to take an unofficial visit. And I know initially there was a report that it was an official visit. Uh, he's already done that. So it'll be an unofficial visit to Georgia for the Tennessee game. Um, obviously, massive setting, you know, Tennessee, Georgia, a couple of top five teams. And, uh, you know, you wonder how much of a role that plays just kind of kind of the same thing with Colton Vosick where he talked about I just wanted to go see Texas and Alabama play you know that kind of thing obviously this is a little different situation not a hometown school not a legacy so I'm not saying there's a direct parallel but it, it is at least you know I guess like if you want to find the silver lining he's not going to see Georgia as they host Georgia Tech or something like there there's a that's a game a lot of people would like to go see at the same time uh, Anthony Evans all along has been very adamant about how solid he is with Oklahoma and, you know, just, n he's not worried. I, and, and he was, he said after the Texas game, like, I don't know why he'd watch Kansas and all that offensive explosion. And especially Marvin Mims, a guy who has a style very similar to his and not say, yeah, that, that seems like that could work for me. Um, but at the same time, I mean, this is guys, we talk about this, like, for most programs, this is just a normal part of the game. Like, guys take visits sometimes. It's not a big deal. I mean, 20 years ago, this was a huge story. Now, most of the time, commits visit, and it's, you know, sometimes you lose them. Most of the time, you don't, and it's fine. But with, again, like we talked about all summer, with the policy that OU has in place with commitments, you know, if you take a visit, you're no longer considered commitment uh, a commitment in their book. It creates a lot of tension and angst and you know the where you know i i'm i'm sure anthony evans probably wanted to keep this quiet you know that kind of like it just the, it, it creates some weird conversations that probably don't have to be as contentious as they are um or at least from the outside looking in would seem contentious so yeah obviously not good news for oklahoma now the good news is is it breaks this early so OU has 10 days to talk about it. And, you know, obviously Damian, LaDamian Washington's going to have conversations with Anthony Evans. I'm sure Brent Venables will. I'm sure Jeff Levy will. Um, and then we'll, we'll see if that trip actually happens. If it happens, then all bets are off. Any, anything could happen. If it doesn't, I, I think it's a pretty clear indication of where he is with Oklahoma. Is the whole, it just like, is the, the visit, whatever you want to call it, rule, whatever. It just seems like they're kind of making a mockery of it. Like, it, it seems preventable. Don't have this stupid-ass rule where you're telling guys you can't go take visits. I, I, I've never been a fan of it. I, I don't understand it. I feel like it's very outdated. And it cre like I said, it creates tension that you just don't need like right. okay you're gonna take that visit like let us know we're gonna talk about it and I you do, can still I do get it though guys i mean like you know they they want to know who is in their class now it's their fault for losing three games in a row i mean you're just gonna have mm -hmm. yeah it's gonna be harder when you have a season like this but if they're playing well and it's a normal season for ou like you're not having to worry about is this guy flip-flopping on us is he is he really committed or are we going to have to, you know, because when you scramble at the last minute, you're just not going to get a guy that's as good usually. I'm also wondering if it, there was going to be like a qualifier to it. It can be an unofficial, but it can't be an official visit. I mean, it's something that was never clarified. So I don't know if that's like the wiggle room that you leave for Colton Vosick a couple times throughout the course of the season. Now Anthony Evans, like, oh, it was on. It was just an unofficial. So it's not that big of a deal. It, it I, I, okay. In a perfect <laughs> world, in a perfect world, I understand the thought behind it. I do. These are high school kids where the situation is going to change. Like what Anthony Evans signed up for in June, guys, what we were talking about when he committed was, wow, look, this is a playoff team and blah, blah, blah. And Brent Venables is going to get everything right. And it's all going to be good. That's not what he's gotten. So, like, at what point do you have to hold up your end of the bargain to expect them to hold up theirs? Yeah. Like, that, that, that I, to me, the, and, and again, 
losses happen sometimes. I'm not blaming OU. Like, you lose games. Things don't go the way you want them to. Dillian Gabriel gets knocked out, which changes the next game and a half of your life. Like, I get all that. I, I acknowledge it. But that's what I'm – like, with a rule like this that is hard and fast, you don't allow any nuance. And I think that in recruiting – you, you've got to have some, like the because <laughs> that's we, all like, it is. The Colton Vosick thing. Colton Vosick's an incredibly unique situation, and I it, it does look like in a lot of ways Oklahoma has dealt with that. Like you know, like because there's no news that oh he's he's decommitted and it, he's out. No use not considering him a commitment or anything like that. I think they have accepted that that is a little bit of a unique scenario, but uh, again and. and at this point, we're looking at two guys in Oklahoma's first class that are are taking trips. Yeah. Like, w- what is this accomplishing? Like, it's not doing what you're saying it's going to do. So what are we what are we talking about? Like, you're you're just like saying, well, we don't consider you committed. Okay, you're just make you're doing their job for them if they're going to decommit. At least make them make the call. You know, it is interesting, too. And, Josh, we talked about this, uh, me and you did, in Denton at the uh, at the Geyer game, just as far as you get out of that dark period. I think we all kind of thought, well, shit, here it comes. You're, there's going to be some decommitments. Mm-hmm. And you look up now. You're a couple weeks out of this thing. It seems like everything is calmed. They haven't had any decommitments. They still have a top five class in the country. And – you almost have a little bit more hope. It's like, okay, maybe this thing is going to stay together maybe a little A&M bit. A&M keeps losing. Well, we'll get, to, Texas, we'll get to them yeah. in a second I because mean, it's hard not to just <laughs> really revel in everything that's happening at College Station right now. We're just going to read Lane Kiffin tweets during that whole portion, <laughs> or uh, Lane Kiffin quotes. He, he's he's had, had a good day. He's had there. a good day. Oh, he's had no. a good morning <laughs> on the podium. Wow. But then again, you know, I, and I guess that kind of does lead into a little bit more of the recruiting side with Oklahoma. And, you know, we look up now that you're a couple of weeks removed when all of this stuff started happening and you kind of go, OK, well, David Hicks, what's going on there? Like it, it, it's fascinating the way that this stuff has been able to change in a matter of a week's time as far as, you know, a month ago, you would have thought a and going to get everybody their net. This thing's going to. Who, Never. Whoever they decide they want to pay for, right? They're they're going to get. Where, where I guess the question is, Josh, where is the David Hicks situation? <laughs> do they have a fighter's chance? I think they do. I think they do to the point that I've started looking at the end of his schedule. And I'm like, do I need to go to a game here? Like, am I going to have to do that again? And you know, kind of felt like that race was run and all the. Katie Paytow has had a hell of a wild year. Oof. A um, lot, lot has gone on in that program. Just over the last month and a half, it's just been crazy. A lot of them. Facebook posts out there. Yeah, a lot happening. Um, and not in any way connected to the Hicks family. Like, I don't want to misrepresent that at all. It's just the high school has gone through a lot. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Oklahoma has a chance here. With, all, with what you're seeing at A&M and how things are going and the rumors of, you know, just – massive transfers and the and the, the rally guys they're three and four and I, there's a I, there's a very real situation where they don't go to a bowl this year like a team that was in the top 10 is one of the most talented teams in college football and now has all these rumors of guys uh doing stuff in the locker room that i think even eddie would say is probably not appropriate and a bit of a taboo so uh, you know it feels like the wheels are starting to come off just a little bit. Um, but it's $83 million to buy them out or whatever it 86. is. 86. 85, oh, no, 85, no, 9. Going anywhere. That's Ooh. the biggest problem. <laughs> oh, I, um, I mean, if this thing heads south like it could for A&M, and the numbers out there on Texas A&M are just incredible, going 2-6 and six against eight their last eight FBS opponents. Mm-hmm. They haven't had a... four games since they've had a 300-yard passer. Right. It just, like, it's insane. But, and, like, is anybody surprised? Like, the, it, I don't... Like, that... Uh, it's, like, the most f- infuriating thing for me is, like... Oh, it's fun. I think it's fun. We've always known that Jimbo it's Fisher like, was duh. a terrible <laughs> developer of quarterbacks. It's, like, uh, E.J. Manuel is his claim to fame? I mean, like, come on. I mean, well, I mean, well, James is oh, his claim to fame. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. But, but I mean, he had Kellen Mond like, for four had, years to try to do something. I, you know, 
you talk to all these kids and they're like, oh, I want to go to the NFL. I want to do that. And they're like, well, Jimbo's had draft picks. I'm like, have you seen how those guys have done in the NFL? It's a horror show. Christian Ponder, you know, you mentioned EJ Manuel. Jameis Winston has been nowhere near a number one overall pick. I mean, he hasn't been Jamarcus Russell bad, um, but not good. So you're just like, I, I, at what point – do these things start to matter? Do these things start to add up? And I just, I don't know when that day comes, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, just to, like I said, to round it off, I, I think Oklahoma has a chance with Hicks. I think it's going to be interesting. I think there's, it's going to be very, uh, uh, subversive is probably not the right word, but very quiet. I don't expect to see a lot. I don't expect to hear a lot. Um, but as I look at it now, I don't think anything is going to surprise me on signing day in that situation. Um, Cause guys, you know, we've talked about it and I know Eddie, you and I, you know, we, we had talked about it last week. We saw each other. OU's doing more. Like I know it was like, Oh, it's the NIL. And I mean, I'm not saying anybody's matching what A&M's doing. A&M's throwing around just obscene money, but well, don't Miami probably was like asleep. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Which, you're right. Miami's really the only other one. They've really paid off. But, that, that's not working is, either. Which is another great example of, you know, and it might be like a bigger commentary just as far as NIL stuff goes. When you're giving these guys millions of dollars, and I'm not saying that they don't, like, deserve it. I still think that they should be paid or compensated somehow. It's kind of changing the game as far as, like, what you're getting in return. And, you know, making dumbass decisions like the A&M guys. I don't really know what's happening down in Miami per se, but it just, I don't know. It, it, it kind of makes you, I guess, a, a little bit leery of everything that's going on in the landscape of college football. Can you imagine, though, well, like, you know, it being those kids' ages and having that much money, though? Like, yes, and I'd I be doing the known, same thing. Like, I wouldn't yeah. know what to do. I would have been a total shithead. Right. Like, I mean, 100%. 100%. I, it, like, like, we all have jobs that we worked you know, we worked at the bottom to get where we are now. It's like, and that shaped us and it, it made us, you know, grow up and it made us appreciate, you know, what we have now. Like these guys that are going to A&M in Miami, like they're just being given shit, like, and they haven't done anything yet. Like how is that shaping them, you know, as, as guys that work in the off season or how, you know, how much time they devote, you know, to getting better as a player? Like, it's got to f*** with you a little bit. Well, and I, I think it, more than anything, and it's such a cliche line, but you can't buy culture. You just can't buy it. Like, that's something that can't be made We're overnight. We're not making that T-shirt, by the way. You can't buy culture? Yeah. We could probably I don't want to be like Iowa State. Oh, is that theirs? Well, they were the five-star culture. Oh, Remember that's those right. Shirts yeah, that's yeah. right. I forgot about that. Uh, but <laughs> it, it's true, though. Like, and especially at, a, at some of these schools that haven't had the success – like, this is, I think, the uh, 22nd year in the last 24 seasons that a and going to have four losses or more. Like, you just can't. Because you're throwing a bunch of money at it doesn't mean it's all going to be yeah, fixed. money can't solve everything. Uh, I, I, I it can solve put, a lot of problems, but maybe not on a football field. I put crystal ball with <laughs> Venables. I think in Building. terms of you're not doing a Band-Aid approach. You're just destroying it all, and you yeah. know you're going to take your lumps, but you, you feel – you'll be better off for it in the long run. Yeah, Jimbo's I mean Jimbo's been there 5 years. So, I mean like Cristobal gets a pass, <coughs> you know, with all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and and guys, I mean we you know, I, I was talking a little while ago about how much I didn't like, you know, and and I and I've always been honest, I just didn't like the policy of the visits and all that stuff. At the same time, I've always agreed with what Venables had to say about the NIL and how they've kind of not made that a, a focal point of what they talk about. You know, that that's not going to be what they pitch, what they sell, doesn't mean it's not there. Doesn't mean that you can't do well at Oklahoma. You absolutely can. But the guys that that's where their focus is, the second things start to go badly, like if OU right now had a roster full of these guys, they'd have a lot of tr they'd have more trouble than they do now. Not to say that everything's rosy and Norman, but like there would be more problems, and you would hear more stories like this because. Like I said a second ago, this is not what we signed up for. We came to A&M told we were going to win national championships because we had the best recruiting class that, you know, let's be honest, that money could buy. So, But, I mean, that's I, the I thing about this, this whole thing, Josh. It's like it really is just, you know, it's about people with a bunch of money just funneling it to players because, yep. like, 
I mean, you see the collectives that, that are, you know, working in Oklahoma space. Like, it's all pretty much, so far, it's been, you know, pretty low-key, like, a little bit of money. It's kind of like what we did with Isaiah. Like, I, mm-hmm. I've never been shy. I've said it. I, we made Isaiah, like, 15 grand overall. Um, so, like, that was pretty good. But that was one guy. Like, could we make 10 guys 15 grand? I don't know. Uh, and we're not going to make any money off of that. Like, uh, I'm, yep. I'm happy to make guys money, but it's not a money-making venture and like everybody thinks that all these collectives that came in and started right away and we're like we're going to be crown funded and so i guarantee you they're not making very much money and they're all probably thinking to themselves why do we do this uh but what is going to work is somebody with a bunch of money behind it that like this one oklahoma thing i think you know they're they're going to be in our building uh they're renovating a space right next to us um but i you know i know people look at the deals that they've announced so far it's like drake stoops General Booty and uh, Gavin Freeman. T. Uh, T. R. A. Jennings. Jennings today. Oh, T. R. A. Jennings. Jennings today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. But I, I have heard the softball girls are making a pretty good amount of money, <laughs> well, and they, rightfully yeah, so. They, they should. should. They, yeah. yeah absolutely. And like I said, if you like what I what I like about the one Oklahoma State is you can tell from a marketing perspective they're a marketing company. Like they're they're getting kind of unique storylines. Like General Booty, obviously, like he's he's not any good and he's not going to play, but. Uh, nobody wants to say that out loud, but it's the truth. Um, but he's got the well, name. You said it twice now, <laughs> trying to burn the poor kid. Uh, well, he can just say, well, what did you say about Eric Gray? You know, if he's got a problem <laughs> with that. Um, but uh, no, I mean, but like you can tell that it's, it's a, it's a plan. Like, but they're not going to be, you know, just giving every player on the team 20 grand or whatever, 40 grand or 50. I, I doubt. I mean, I, unless you get a donor that comes in, and gives you millions of dollars. Like, that's the only way that this works in these team-wide deals. So. No, I, I agree. It'll be interesting to see. You know, I think there's another collective entering the Oklahoma space here. They've made an announcement. I think that they're, like, officially going to make an announcement maybe in early November. So, uh, I, and I think it'll be a positive one. But, again, like, who cares? You shouldn't be upset about it. I mean, sure. there are a lot yeah. of collectives. I sure. mean, the more the merrier. Yeah, and I, I think at the end of the day, if everybody is, you know, progressing in the right direction, it will be a positive. Everybody can win. Yeah. It's a, it's a situation and, that everybody can get in. And if you get people that know what they're doing, they're going to weed out the ones that sure. don't know what they're doing. Yep. 100%. 100%. Uh, Josh, I guess, do we want to backtrack a little bit and talk about Geyer? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we have to. I mean, I mean that, the that helicopter. Was... God damn, they're good. And yeah, they did. Jeff Levy and Brandon Hall came in on a helicopter, and they they juked me out. They were supposed to land on on the side of a, on the one side of the stadium, and landed on the other. There are about a hundred people on YouTube that got to see a live uh, video of you being like, "God damn it, they landed on the other side." <laughs> well, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to have a heart attack running around. And then there was some mariachi band at some point. It seems like I remember, and like it was. They like, have a nice little tailgate for the parents down there at Geyer. Yeah. So it was, uh, but the game was incredible. Jackson Arnold, obviously really, really good. Uh, I think that Josh, we both kind of agreed that Peyton Bowen might've been the best player on the field that night. That's, I mean, and I don't mean that as any disrespect to Jackson Arnold because he was very good. Peyton Bowen's unbelievable. That that was my, I mean, as crazy as it is, that was my first time to see him in a game. Like I've seen him at some camps and some other stuff. I've never seen him in a game and Holy cow. Like just his, the way he reads stuff, the way he sees it. And he is so physical. Um, I, like I said, uh, he was one of those guys like even uh, and you, when you talk about a five star, the thing I've always talked with coaches about, like they want to go to a game. They don't want to know the names. They don't want to know who anybody is a five star. Like you should, you, a, you should see them and B you can't miss them when the game starts. And that, I mean, Peyton Bowen, that return, yeah, he was down on it, you know, fine, whatever. I don't care. Like, that that was an incredible play. And then you throw around some of the the hits he made on that opening drive and Allen was coming down the field. Like, the, Allen wanted no part of him. Like, they, they knew it, and they were like, nope, we don't want to mess with that dude. He's just something else. And, I mean, when you stick out on a field that had, I mean, by the time it's all said and dead, probably 10 Power 5 guys – on it and you're probably the best player on it that's that's something man he he is he's the best like realistic target i've seen for ou at safety i i don't know i mean 10 15 years like he he's very very good 
I was just I was surprised, you know, just overall uh, guy or size compared to Allen. Because I mean, Allen's a really good program. Yeah. Uh, the last time I saw Allen, Kyler Murray was a junior, and you know they had Bobby Evans at one tackle, yeah. Greg Little at the other. They had another guy that signed, I think, with Baylor or something at, at guard. Like I mean, they had a bunch of dudes, and you know, like I think twelve guys ended up signing one. It was jarring, to, like. Allen has five or six D1 guys, and you're like, wow, this team sucks compared to where Allen used to be. And like That's just how far like how far up the mountain they had gone. I mean, they were arguably the best team in the country at one point. So it, it was kind of crazy to see them where they were. But I, some of that is just Geyer is really, really yeah. good and really, really complete. Like, they're not perfect or anything, but there's no obvious hole. Like, I, I'll be interested to see, like, when they face like a Katie or like a run heavy team, like how their defensive front would hold up. But that's really the only thing I could think of where I'd say, let's see where that goes. But other than that, I mean, they're a very complete team. I've seen Geyer three times now and I, I love what they have like in their front seven. I don't think that they're guys mm -hmm. that are necessarily like just loaded with power five guys, but there are some really, really good high school football players on that team. Yep. Well, and that's the thing, Eddie, like, it's not that they're not good players, but when you start going up against those schools, like they don't have Jackson Arnold at quarterback, but they've got a Florida commitment at running back and two offensive linemen going to U of H. I mean, that's cool that you've got those great high school players, but man, eventually you meet your, you know, the, sure. the water level gets too high. And, uh, and so, like I said, I don't know, but I mean, What's crazy is I'm just looking at Dave Campbell's Texas football. Geyer is currently ranked sixth in the state in 6A that's crazy. and looks that good. <laughs> and that's just that tells you how insane it is in Texas. North Shore's one, obviously Westlake with Vosick is two, and then you got Duncanville, South Lake Carroll, Katy, and then Geyer. I mean that's that's just a bunch of monsters, that's you know, one after another. Basically a who's who of Texas high school uh -huh. football. I mean, my God, they're just it's it's loaded. I. From from Jackson's perspective, I mean, obviously we, we put up the interview with them and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, I don't think that there was anything necessarily groundbreaking, uh, you know, with with what he said. But I don't know how many more times the kid has to come out and be like, <laughs> "Hey, I'm committed to Oklahoma. Don't worry about anything." You know, he he's still the captain of this unit. When Marcus Freeman comes out and pulls a uh, Mickey Joseph and mentions Jackson Arnold by name going to visit that weekend, then maybe I'll believe the Notre Dame stuff. But like, I, I, I do like people keep asking me like, Josh, could you check in with someone? I'm like, man, we can't do this every week. Right. Like, we, we just can't <laughs> bog these kids down every week with the, okay, now is this the week where you lose hope? Like how, how do you continue to have that conversation? So I, I thought Jackson was very clear in it. I thought he was honest. Like, I mean, I, I thought one of the more telling things was when he talked about, um, you know, I said, well, what's it been like to recruit other guys? You know, now that and he was like, it's tougher. It just is. It's tougher. And I was like, that's a real because a lot of guys would just give you a bull answer there. And he didn't do that. Like it, it, it is. I mean, that's what we're talking about with Anthony Evans and Colton Vosick. When you start losing games, things get, the the margins get tighter. The, the, the ways to differentiate yourself from other programs is harder to do because for so long, Oklahoma could always say, well, cool, man, you can go there, but we're going to beat you anyway. You know, that kind of thing. And that's not there right now. So it, it, it makes things more complex, but yeah, I, he's solid. I, I think it's going to take something just cataclysmic for him not to be at Oklahoma like that. That's where he wants to be. That's where he's comfortable. He really likes Jeff Levy. Um, and you know, he talked about how meaningful it was to have Levy there watching him, you know, on that that big stage, national TV, and everybody watching him. I don't know if he can go anywhere, uh, you know, like from a Power 5 perspective, scholarship-wise, but I've seen Guy obviously, now three times, and I think Landon slide, Sides mm. is a oh, hell yeah. of a wide receiver. Absolutely. I don't know, like, from a walk-on standpoint, obviously I'm sure that he would have an opportunity to be a preferred walk-on at Oklahoma. Is that the number uh, nine kid? Seven. 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 I seven. think that kid mm -hmm. is a really good football player, and he kind of complements everything that they have at the wide receiver unit. They, he can go downfield and get the ball. He can make plays uh, if you get to the ball to him in space. I I don't know. I, I love that kid, though. He was a kid like everybody. So I, I told a few people I was coming, and a couple people like Guy were like, 
Watch him. Just watch this kid. I swear he's good. And he scores that touchdown right in front of us, Eddie. That long, the last yeah. throw. I think it was. I think it was Arnold's last play of the night. Um, yep. And you were just like, dang. I mean, that that dude's got a little juice. I mean, like they're, you know, yeah, you, you hate to run into. I the know where you're going. I know where you're going. Comparison, but like, there's some Gav Freeman stuff there. <laughs> there's, there's, you're like maybe that, a little Drake Stewart. Maybe a little Drake. Maybe yep. Wes, the, the, some more Wes Walker. Walker. Yeah. <laughs> Who else can we throw? No, it, yeah, I mean, I it mean, is. It's true. Uh, you know, you, you just name your white Wayne Crebet. I mean, they're they're all there, man. It's it's all there. But no, um, I like I said, I I don't. If you're OU and like we know there's a need at receiver, I think you know we all expect probably a couple guys to go through the portal, and obviously that's not going to be the guy you expect to replace those scholarship guys at least in year one. But you know, you need numbers. I. I don't know why he wouldn't be a focal point of your preferred walk-on plans. No doubt. Well, we'll probably see Geyer again at some point here over the you know the course of so the next month and a half. So you mean missing their first game of the season hasn't ended up being a catastrophe? No, I think it's worked out pretty well. And I I like Jackson too. I like just from not even a football perspective. I think he's a pretty cool kid. Uh, I you know he kind of has that. I don't know. Is is it moxie of like a a big time he gets high school it. quarterback? Oh yeah, like mm-hmm. you feel comfortable with he, if he's gonna be the guy in you know X amount of years at Oklahoma. It's like yeah, I I could definitely buy into that. I see that. Well, he he walks that nice line that I think all quarterbacks have to. Like you want him confident, you won't want him arrogant. And like and he does a good job of being like confident, but he's not arrogant. Like he's not a like a dude, you're like, oh, I gotta talk to this friggin' kid again. Like it's not that way. Like he just, he knows he's good, and that and that's okay. But he's not, you know, he's not a shit about it or anything. So I, I, I'm impressed watching his demeanor. He, he seemed very calm the whole time. Obviously, a lot of kids, even really good players, you put them in a scenario like that, and they can get kind of shaky. And boy, he didn't bat an eye. I mean, he he just drove them up and down the field all night. And it's one of those things too that you know I. I don't know. Maybe I just fall into this trap and it's something that you can't get away from. But the idea that he comes from a program that gets it as well, he's not going to be overwhelmed by, and it's, you know, obviously it's going to be different playing at Denton Guyer than it is at Oklahoma and being the quarterback at Oklahoma. But I don't think it's going to be too much for him to step into a role where, you know, basically once he gets to Norman, everywhere he goes in town, everything that he does is going to be under a microscope. Oh, there's, yeah. I mean, there's just no question. But yeah, you know, I, I guess to move. I mean, you know, we also got a chance to see one of the guys that's our primary guy, uh, in tw- or one of their primary three offers at quarterback, and that's Michael Hawkins in 2024. As good as Arnold was, Hawkins was about that shaky at times. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. Now, it felt really thought, weird because he looked good in the first half, and when that yep. running back went down, it's like Allen didn't know what to do. Yeah, that because it just took away that whole. I you know, Geyer just did could just kind of tee off and key on him, and it changed the whole dynamic of that game. No, I mean, Geyer was winning that game anyway. They right. were the better team, but. Uh, and again, I, I th- on the, uh, Allen's opening drive, they scored. You'll never tell me they didn't score on third down. Like that, <laughs> that kid was in the scoring. end zone. <laughs> and I'm like, what is happening? I'm looking at the side judge coming in. I'm like, okay, he's just trying to get a look. The kid's waist is in the end zone. I'm like, how do you think that happened? Like, it, it just, it was crazy to me that they didn't see it. And then, you know, again, I guess you get so, as much, even as much high school football as I watch. I'm like, they're going to review that. No, nope. no, nope, that's not a review. Like, there's no review here. <laughs> so like, like, you do that to yourself sometimes. And, uh, but no, I mean, it was 100%, in my opinion, a touchdown. I thought Allen struggled from that point on to really get their feet under him because it was just, you know, Geyer, that, that offense and Jackson Arnold and all the weapons it has, like, man, you're really going to struggle to keep them under wraps for long. What did you think about the D end? I, I thought he kind of had a quiet night. They weren't necessarily running at him the entire night, though. Yeah, uh, Zena Umi Azulu, uh, the 2024 defensive end. There's a reason for why I didn't attempt that. <laughs> the defensive end. <laughs> <laughs> I, figured, I figured you left that for me. Um, now, Zena, A, has put on some good weight since the last time I see him. I thought he uh, saw him. I thought he was starting to fill out a little bit. And it was an interesting thing because – 
I like when I would focus on him and zero in on him. I was like, he looks good, man. His his step would co- he came off the ball well. Uh, he, he showed some use with his hands. He's extremely long guy. Um, and you, I kind of thought, okay, you know, like sooner or later tonight, he's going to make a play. Like I'm going to see him do something here. As I kind of watched him in the first quarter. And then, you know, you get to like mid fourth and you're like, I don't think they've called his name all night. And so I don't really know what to make of that. Now, some of that I think is, you know, like we talk about all the time when, you know, uh, we, we look at, you know, I, I've talked before about guys like PJ Atabari or Colton Vosick or some of these other defensive linemen I've seen. I, I think Geyer is really smart and schemed up some ways to, to like not let him be part of the game. They weren't going to let him beat him. But at the same time, a guy that good and is, you know, with all his offers and his rankings, you're like, I'd like to see him just at some point, just, you know, I, I'm going to make a play here. Like th- I'm going to be involved. Like PJ at a bar, eh? they, they doubled him, schemed him all night, but there were a couple times it was just like, there's nothing we can do with that dude. Like it's sometimes a really great player just going to do it. And that's what, that's really my only concern. Cause like I said, I, I saw the parts that I like, like it wasn't like lethargy, wasn't being lazy, wasn't not doing stuff. I just would like to see him finish a play every once in a while. Yeah. And Josh, you mentioned Jackson Arnold trying to recruit and how tougher it's, it's been by this time next week. Caden McDonald's decision will, will be in. We are all worried about Clemson visit that has now come and gone. Is this another re- recruit where OU is maybe just going to finish second or third? It it still could, but I have talked about it in woke. I'm not going to give it all away here. I know our our board members love it when I put something in woke and then you it just shows up. You listeners, you're not getting it. For free. Yeah, yeah. Sign up. Stop being. You know, it, it's almost him. Christmas. Tell, Look at him. Tell tell your tell your significant other that you you need a schooner scoop membership as, so as we right get now. close to signing day so uh, go ahead and sign up get that taken care of you can go month to month if you want to that's fine um, but no there is um uh, I get the feeling that what we have all believed about Caden McDonald for a long time is wrong like I, I don't know how else to say it I, I think they're what I would have predicted a week ago is absolutely not what I would predict now and I'm not sure I know right now like i i thought barring some huge change it was going to be clemson i don't know that we've seen any big change but i wouldn't bet on clemson right now um and i think oklahoma is right there in the thick of it with some other uh, you know i i with some other schools um it's it's going to be really interesting I, i'm gonna like i kind of thought like i was going to be on cruise control in that coverage this week because I just didn't expect there to be anything. But with what I've heard, I think it goes one of several ways. And I think Oklahoma is one of those options. Um, I'm not sure that's where I would pick right now, but I Oklahoma is a contender here, like more so than I would have thought a week ago. So this is going to get pretty interesting. Um, my understanding at last I had checked and I need to go back and look into this a little bit more was that Todd Bates was going to be there Friday night to watch him play. So that gets interesting. Um, you, you would take that as a sign that Oklahoma is going to go down swinging and do everything they can. They know Caden McDonald's important to this class. Um, I don't think that's going to swing it or anything, but for them to even be there, they think they're in it. Like they think they're right there. So I, I take that as a good sign for OU and we'll, we'll see. But, um, this is this is this has gotten a lot more interesting in the last like forty eight hours. Very interesting. Um, I don't think we can. Josh, I I feel like he's trying to filibuster this with re- recruiting because he knows there was a basketball exhibition last exhibition. night. Exhibition. <laughs> real quick, real quick, from a recruiting perspective, twenty twenty five kid don't need to spend a whole lot of yeah. time. Two twenty twenty five kids. Devon Mitchell, Allen, tight end. I mean. If there's a better Good tight Lord. end in the 2025 class, I don't he's know. He's in I the mean, state. That, that kid. Ten miles south of he's here. He's in the running for an O.J. Howard crush for me. That kid is going to be I, good. That, you literally read my mind, Kerry. I was like, that's that's got big O.J. Howard energy for Kerry <laughs> right there. But more so, Nate Roberts, in-state offer, 2025 from Washington, uh, a school that I think a lot of people will become familiar with here over the next couple years. Uh, number one team, I believe, right now in class two A. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, 
obviously Cooper Alexander, Stephen Alexander's sons down healthy, there at Washington. Finally. Uh, but oh, oh, you did offer Nate Roberts, and that was out on Wednesday morning. Yeah, uh, you know, and this is a kid I had a chance to see. Um, I, he was one of the focal points of me going to see a a camp at where was that Kiefer? Where what? No, it wasn't Kiefer. I can't can't even remember now. I was going to give them. I was going to give them a little love, and now I've forgotten where that camp was. But it was just a, a little, you know, kind of three A, two A camp up in um, uh, kind of north of Oklahoma City, and I just. Like you see the kid and you're like, wow, okay. And then to know he's on, you know, he now shares a roster with Cooper Alexander, the 2024 tight end um, to have those guys l- lined up is awesome. But Roberts is a, a natural receiver. His older brother is a tight end at North Texas that I know North Texas is just continues to be excited about. Jake is a really good player for them. Um, I don't honestly know where he is at, where, how things have gone for him this year, but I know coming into the year, there was a lot of, uh, kind of belief he was going to have a big season. So, uh, but Nate, good natural pass catcher, moves around really well. Only going to get more explosive and kind of dynamic. I think he's he's not a he fits into kind of that Jason Llewellyn mold. Like you could flex him sometimes if you want to, but he's he's probably most at home as kind of an inline tight end. Uh, going to work over the middle. Very physical guy. Real tough. And you know, for those um, you know that just immediately run to this question. He's a kid that grew up an Oklahoma fan. This offer means a lot to him. He's got, you know, Kentucky, Baylor, Tennessee. Um, he's, he is going to be a, I, I would guess probably a rivals 250 kind of guy. Um, and that 2025 class, I, I talked about it a little bit on Twitter last night. I started going over some tape, just looking around the state a little bit. And there are a lot of really good players. Um, Elijah Thomas at Shakota, I think that dude may be outstanding. Might be one of the better receivers to come out of Oklahoma in a while. Um, and then, you know, you, you look at the quarterbacks. There are four possible Power 5 quarterbacks in the state of Oklahoma in 2025. I can't – I say it a lot. I can't get over it. It's just crazy. So, I don't want to go over to 2025. We, we all know I could get into in-state recruiting for far too long. But it is um, – that looks like maybe the next great class in state. Like there's a lot of talent and from unique places, Muskogee, Chicota, Washington, uh, just some different locales that we haven't seen as much. You know, you've got Ravy and Larry at Idabel, Grayson at Beggs. I mean, you just kind of go all over the state. So, um, it, uh, it's going to be fun to track. And I I think you're going to see some more in-state offers in the next month or two. It wouldn't, wouldn't shock me if Elijah Thomas joins the ranks, probably within the next 10 to 15 days. It'll be good to see all those guys up at Union or Jinx or Bixby here in a couple years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe. Uh, you never know. Well, you never know. you know, they got OSSAA uh, approved the NIL thing, so. I'm sure that will be handled real well with care. All right, uh, so we had two of you guys were at a basketball exhibition last night, Eddie and, and Bob, both uh, up there last night. And how different, Bob, does this team look than what we saw last on the floor? Like their athletic ability and like the freshmen. And we'll just sort of see if that's going to be enough to get them over the, the hump and trying to make a run to the tournament this year. But it, I, I actually thought it was okay watching them shoot brick after brick after brick because it's like – good because then last year exhibition game they made like 18 threes people got so excited it's like that's not gonna happen it's gonna be more like a night like last night where it's not falling and you have to figure it out and when you got grant Sherfield, joe bamisil like the athletic ability that they bring to the table take a uwe los uzan both looked very comfortable as a freshman that i'm sort of wondering you know who's Who's going to be that starting five? I think Bamisil, Sherfield, Tanner Grove, Jalen Hill. Will one of those freshmen be good enough to earn that spot right from the jump? I I was really impressed with, with uh, Uzon last night. There there and Porter talked about it after the game, but there's just there were little flashes throughout the game. I didn't think that they like you said they didn't play well. In a way, they still won by thirty six. Uh, but there were flashes throughout the night that was like, okay, like this, this looks a little bit different than what they've had here over the last couple years. And, you know, obviously Grant Sherfield's going to, I think he's going to be really, really good newcomer of the year in the big 12 uh, preseason. But, you know, Uzon, 
from a point guard standpoint, I thought played pretty well. There were moments, the one where he gets around the corner on the guy. That's just stuff that you really hadn't seen from mm-hmm. OU guard play here over the last couple years. So we'll give everybody the kind of the benefit of the doubt. They need to make the NCAA tournament this year in Porter Moser's second season. And, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see where this thing goes. I, I think that they should be competitive enough to get into the NCAA tournament. You just run into the situation that they did a year ago where, you know, if you lose some of those games in the last five minutes like yep. they did a year ago, you're going to be right back into the spot that you were, you know, last season. And that's what Moser's been talking about with Sherfield time and time again. He's a shot clock guy. And he's that crunch, that, that crunch time guy when you need to try to make a play in the last five, ten seconds of a sh- shot clock. Sherfield's going to be able to either shoot it or he's going to create something for one of his teammates. And, you know, it's just going to be about knocking down shots. They didn't do it last night. And, you know, that's fine. Exhibition. But, you know, they're going to have to shoot a heck a heck of a lot, lot better. Now they go to a quote-unquote secret scrimmage that's not a secret against Oregon in Las Vegas on Saturday. Why do they do this? Like, I don't why know. is it supposed to be so secret? I have no idea. It, it always gets out, and then it's always hush-hush about what, actu- what actually happened there. It just makes no sense why they wouldn't. I mean, I can understand if you don't want to let fans come into the games and stuff, but it just seems so NCAA stupid that you're supposed to act like it didn't happen <laughs> when it did happen, and then... You know, you'll look up on Saturday evening or something. John Rostin will put out. Yes, like, he will. <laughs> you know, Grant Shurfield had 23 points and 11 assists. It's like, well, I thought you weren't supposed to talk about it. <laughs> and you know where you're getting the information. Like, come on. So we'll see. Two weeks until uh, a week from Monday, I guess, until the uh, season November opener. 7th, indeed. And they should have all their pieces back. Bijan Cortez missed the exhibition because of concussion protocol. He is back today. Luke Northweather tweaked an ankle last Friday. Porter said he's actually doing better than what they first thought. He could play against Oregon. I would seriously doubt that he would, but they'll all be ready to go for the season opener against Sam Houston, November 7th. All right. Uh, Iowa State this weekend. Eddie Bob headed up. Going back to Thanks Ames. To this is my Lexus. first time to back to Ames in, uh, since 2018. 2018. But I did. I went uh, solo last time during the COVID did, year. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I talked about I had kind of forgotten about it, but I, I pulled up the uh, email that you guys got in 2014. Oh, my from God. From the lady. Yeah. Crazy uh, that, lady. That was, a, that was a good memory. I'm you, hoping to run you, into Bev from we've Minneapolis. Had something, and you've had that, and we had the Cubs in 2016, and then you had the uh, traffic ticket. Well, that I don't know if that happened. <laughs> I don't know if the traffic there ticket There was happened. literally <laughs> photographic <laughs> evidence. It wasn't me. It was I don't know how. You. We, we were the... Don't remember it all where it's something like I'm that. Just say that happened. you get a boss pays one time. Now on it's on you. <laughs> I was never pulled over. I know. We yeah, were we were pulled over. I got one in LA like that too, though. Because we were I was in the Hov that's, lane by that's myself. Big brother, I think. I think that's Big Brother taking over uh, you know. Taking over everything. That's that they uh, do. we we have our first Aggie in the transfer portal. Oh, really? Da, 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 yeah, it's done. a kicker punter. It's not oh. nearly. It's not nearly as exciting as it sounds. But you know, we, why, if if we'll just cut the second part out, it's going to sound really sexy but that we report. They can't that, really so. enter the portal because their coach hasn't been fired. Well, they can mm-hmm. say I'm yeah, going to enter oh. December fifth, right? Just like that Auburn kid mm-hmm. did yesterday. He'll be able to enter sooner because his coach <laughs> is getting fired. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's. That's going to be fun watching and, the chaos at A&M unfold as it continues. Uh, no I, doubt. I do want to drop it in here real quick at the end. I have talked to a few people about the Anthony Evans situation. I will have something up on the board shortly. Very good. What a tease he is today. All right, that's mm. going to do Inter- it. Interesting week in the Big 12 ahead. Another interesting yeah. week just from a perspective of who knows what's going to happen in Manhattan with Adrian, Adrian Martinez, Martinez status. OSU Texas was a really good football game last week. Really yeah. long football game. It is strange that OU and OSU are oh, playing on the, the road kind of close to each other. Like, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, in Manhattan and Ames. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, anyway, yeah, it's going to be fun watching. I, I know it's sacrilege. I really enjoyed watching the Texas-Oklahoma State game last that weekend. That was a lot of fun. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, looking forward to more. Just hopefully Oklahoma can get back in the mix. Not in the mix for the Big 12, but just a winning mix. You heard it here first. Kerry thinks they're going to be in Arlington. <laughs> Check your tickets. Get those scenarios going. I better get us out of here. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week for another edition. And also, we'll be back for the post game, uh, Eskridge Lexus post game after the Iowa State game. So thanks for listening. We'll be back next week for another edition of the Unofficial 40 podcast right here on Soonerscoop.com.